Welcome to the Healthcare Executive Podcast, providing you with insightful commentary and developments in the world of healthcare leadership. To learn more, visit ACHE.org. And without further ado, your host. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to the Healthcare Executive Podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Steve Clasco. He is executive in residence at General Catalyst, a venture capital firm that makes early stage and transformational investments, a number of which are in healthcare. Now, before that, he served as president of Thomas Jefferson University and CEO of Jefferson Health in Philadelphia, where under his leadership, Jefferson expanded from three hospitals to 18 and from a health sciences university to a professional university with multiple campuses. Revenue grew from $1.8 billion to $9 billion on his watch. His track record of success earned him various accolades in 2018, including the number two spot on modern healthcare's 100 most influential individuals and the number 21 spot on Fast Company's list of the 100 most creative people in business. That year, he was also named to Becker's Hospital Review's 100 Great Leaders in Healthcare. Dr. Clasco began his career as a community obstetrician, and he is the author of 2020's Unhealthcare, a Manifesto for Health Assurance. In 2019, he spoke about the future of hospitals at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and in 2020 was named a Distinguished Fellow of the World Economic Forum and co-chair of its Board of Stewards for the Forum's platform on the digital economy. He will be co-presenting Responsible Innovation in the Age of Digital Health, the Expanding Opportunities for Healthcare CEOs at ACHE's 2023 Congress on Healthcare Leadership, which will take place March 20th through the 23rd in Chicago. He'll share how to create a path within healthcare organizations to set leaders up for success and what the ideal healthcare CEO looks like now and in the future. You can register for Congress today at ACHE.org slash Congress. With that introduction, let's hear more about Dr. Clasco. Welcome to the Healthcare Executive Podcast. Thanks. It's uh, it's really exciting to be on with you. And uh, it's a Great time to be talking about healthcare and a uh, great time to be thinking about a very different future. Okay. So before we get into the future, let's talk about your background a little bit. I guess we'll want to know what you led you into medicine and ultimately what you drew you to the leadership side of healthcare. Well, you know, I'll, I'll go from uh, 1974 to 2023 in about 30 seconds. I started, right. my career, started my career as a DJ and as somebody reminded me in L.A., as they said, oh, that was when DJs made uh, less than doctors, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, so that was pre pitbull. Um, got fired and 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 ended up going into medicine. But the reason I said that'll quickly get us to 2023 is my new book, which uh, is called "Feeling All Right," named after the Joe Cocker song. How the message in the music can create a healthier healthcare is is uh, going to be out in the next month or so, and it's actually published uh, through Health Administration Press. So I think that that concept of being creative in healthcare and thinking about what's going to be obvious 10 years from now and doing it today really has sort of helped me bring my DJ life and my health leader life together. And and the the, the other aha moment I had, I got to be an advisor for Apple. And, you know, if you think about the time when they were a computer and operating system company and uh, Steve Jobs was saying, hey, that's the old math. The new math is digital lifestyle. That's sort of what I brought to Jefferson, that the old math is inpatient revenue and outpatient revenue and NIH funding. The new math is going to be the strategic partnerships with the with the new wave uh, companies like General Catalyst and A16Z and others. What a great combination of backgrounds you bring to the table. Excited to talk about the book in just a minute. But first, let's talk about some of the things you've spoken about, especially the need for change throughout the healthcare industry. Uh, let's talk about, you know, what does the mindset need to be for today's healthcare leaders um, who want to continue driving change forward? Well, the first thing, the, the first and probably most important thing is we have to, we have to, have to, have to, Eric, stop talking about health equity and move it from a philosophic and academic exercise to the mainstream of clinical care and payment models, right? I mean, you know, everybody says, what did, what did the pandemic teach you? Well, the pandemic just accelerated what we already knew. People died. People died, Eric, in the world's richest country because we they didn't have broadband. You know, I was in Philadelphia. It was the home of, of Comcast. And people died because they didn't have broadband. And our fragmented system, health systems lost billions of dollars. Health payers made billions of dollars. That's not anybody's fault either way. So, so we have this broken, fragmented, expensive, and inequitable system that everybody sort of tweaks around with. So the first thing that has to happen is 
we need sort of a, a reimagination of payer provider alignment, how we start to look at social determinants as really a part of the system and not just something else that gets done. We, we had a program called hot spotting um, that, that I'm sure a lot of the people that are listening to this know, but you know, we had, we had a patient with asthma that came in 19 times to the ER, 19 times the ER. She didn't have insurance. So we were paying for that. Well, it turns out when we brought in our community health workers, she had mold in her house. <laughs> so literally hiring a handy person to go and take care of the mold probably saved $300,000 worth of health care, acute care, and, and more importantly, made the patient a whole lot healthier. So I think I think those are the those are the main things. And then as it relates to sort of my old world and my new world, uh, the book that I wrote in 2020 with Hey Montanasia, who's the managing partner of General Catalyst, um, was really started out, what if a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and a CEO of an academic medical center had a baby? What would that move fast and break things mentality with the mission-driven uh, mentality of nonprofit healthcare? How can we bring the best of those both worlds together? Yeah, I love that perspective there. And, you know, what you were just talking about was it's it's not enough to just understand, okay, we need equitable health care. There are ways to apply it and, and different ways that we need to be talking about doing it. One of the other things that's changed a little bit, and this is what your session at Congress is going to focus on, is the opportunities that CEOs of healthcare organizations have today that maybe they haven't had historically. We're talking about playing roles like we're talking about venture capital, the payer space, health policy. Can you talk a little about that evolution and why it's so important? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you, you asked that because I think that... Um... You know, one of the things that I think in my previous 20 years of being a healthcare leader, we were all in our lanes, right? So if you were, you know, if you were a doctor, you could you could be a healthcare administrator or you could be, you know, a physician or you could lead a group. And then we were like amazed that the people running insurance companies or running venture capitalists didn't understand us, right? I'm a big science fiction fan. A couple of my books have been science fiction books. So, you know, the whole issue of being a shapeshifter, you know, we understand healthcare you know, probably, you know, better than anybody. You know, I, I've delivered 2,200 babies. You know, I can't pretend that I understand what it's like to have a baby. So so don't write nasty letters. But but I understand at least the, the mechanics of obstetrics and, and where at least a hospital should be as it relates to women's health. And I think that so getting physicians now, especially younger physicians and more diverse physicians into senior management with payers, or we, you know, at, at, at General Catalyst, we have, um, you know, we have several physicians that have moved over. Uh, Ron Paulus was a CEO of Mission Health. He's an executive in residence like I am. Mark Harrison was a CEO of Intermountain Health. He just moved over. Uh, Daryl Toll uh, ran in, uh, a few of the hospitals at Venice Health. He's leading our partnerships. So that's getting the, the VC world to understand us better. You know, when I first got to to General Catalyst and some of the other VC places, it was like, what's Steve doing here? And now that that these sort of virtual companies have to be scalable and sustainable, I feel a little bit like Mr. Miyagi. Remember the guy in Karate Kid? That you not? Kind of, yes. So, so I think Never that we're it. starting to bring these worlds together. And I think what you'll see at the, at the great uh, ACHE Congress is a few really amazing folks that, that were doctors, that were healthcare leaders, that have now gone into one case uh, uh, of a virtual firm, another case a payer, and really, really understand that you can expand your role. That's what I tell all my mentees. Think about what you want to do. And the real word is impact. So if you're a young medical student or resident or, or, or a doc out there or listening to this, think about where you can have the most impact. And, and that's, that's how I've lived my life. And I think it's a great way to look at the future of healthcare because it's going to be very exciting and it's going to need really talented, younger, more diverse gender and race wise leaders. And I think that's what you'll see at our, at our Congress. Something I've heard from, from VC firms in the past. And when talking about who to bet on, so to speak, it's, it's not necessarily about the horse. It's about the jockey. So what are some of those characteristic CEOs of healthcare organizations need to be in order to be successful leaders today? You know, you did mention focusing on impact. What are some of those other characteristics? Yeah, boy, you know, I think, I think that's a great quote. And, um, I think the, 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 the main, the main thing I look for is passion. Um, you know, that, in, and hey, Montanasia, who's our, our managing partner, you know, told me one time, I asked him, you know, what he likes to ask nowadays, a founder, and he says, I like to ask him what their exit strategy is. And I said, well, what's, what's the best answer? He goes, I don't have one. 
the concept being like this is my passion. I want to I want to bring this. So I think you know we 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 go through cycles. You know when when everything was was just so easy to have AI in your title and your company is worth two billion dollars. You know it was just easy to say I'm going to do this for for two to three years and now I'm going to do that. It's a lot harder now. It's a lot harder now for health system CEOs. It's a lot harder now for founders. So you know companies that I get involved in. And I get excited about uh, are what at GC we call responsible innovation. Um, and, you know, so um, I'm on the advisory board of a company um, uh, out of Brazil called Genio, which is looking at autism care and caregivers. We have another company called Equip Health, um, which is looking at eating disorders. So that's concept of doing well and doing good. Uh, and, it, and and in my other roles, I'm the North American ambassador for Sheba Medical Center. You know, we've created something in Chicago with six health systems in Chicago, you know, that are looking at how technology can affect health equity. I love that. And, and I've really immersed myself in that. And, and, and the third job I have is with Abundant Venture Partners and Avia. And Avia has been sort of a connector between the traditional healthcare ecosystem and, and some of these um, some of these transformational pieces. So they've become almost like an innovation GPO. And again, they've had to change because recognizing near and far really doesn't matter in 2023 to health system CEOs that need to survive now. Mm -hmm. So we've actually, now we have a, one section looking at now and near and another section looking at near and far. So that, that concept of adaptability, flexibility, creativity is really, I think, what, what excites me about bringing the two worlds together. And you started that answer with talking about passion. And now we're going to talk about blending your passion and talking about music. And, you know, we said in your intro, you, you were, you mentioned you were a DJ. Again, I was a DJ. I love music. That's how I got my start too. So let's talk about this book, Feeling All Right, How the Message in Music Can Make Health Care Healthier. It's being published by ACHE's Health Administration Press. It will be available in April. And you use song lyrics to look at healthcare leaders' opportunities to build a more accessible, high quality, equitable healthcare system that we've been talking about. How do you decide to take that sort of approach with this? Eric, you know, um, I think we share something is that we have some DJ roots and um, um, karate you know, kid fans too. I mean, we could keep going science fiction. <laughs> yeah. But, but look, I think music has been my life and, you know, in my ups and my downs. And I think for most of us or not everybody, but for a lot of us, you can almost tie something that happened in your life with a song. I mean, it's easy to Absolutely. think about, you know, if you've met, if you're married or, or you've, you've had a partner, you know, uh, what was playing when you first met them, what was playing when, when you got married, but even beyond that, I, you know, I think a lot of us really connect that to our emotions and our soul. When COVID hit Eric, I, you know, we went through the trifecta in Philadelphia. I had the largest health system in Philadelphia. So, you know, we, we had, we had the most COVID we were dealing with 35,000 employees, we made a really bold decision not to lay off or furlough anybody. At the same time, we we're dealing with the financial tsunami of, you know, at one point, you know, almost losing a billion dollars from where we had predicted. And then we were also one of the epicenters for the whole George Floyd uh, protests and, and the racial reckoning in a, in a university called Te Thomas Jefferson University that I was president of. So, so literally, communication became incredibly important. I did it through songs. Every Friday, I sent a playlist. Eric, and that playlist would be meaningful. And then what was interesting is people would send me back their songs. And it became the way that I communicated with my 35,000 employees to the point where music became so important that Sia, the singer Sia, had this level up challenge for nurses. And we won. Wow. And our nurses were on Ellen virtually because because we won. Music was so important. But even when the when the racial reckoning and, and George Floyd protests happened, you know, I remember some of the songs I I, I I I put out there for that Friday playlist were things like Choice of Colors by The Impressions and I'll Take You There by The Staple Singers. And then I literally had some of our African-American and other employees say, well, you know, here, you know, those are those are really helpful. But how about these? So it became our way of, of communicating. So when I thought about writing this book, you know, I said, OK, you know, I spent so much time thinking about songs come into my mind when I'm thinking about something in healthcare, why don't I just turn that into something? So bottom line is about 50 songs, but each chapter is led by a song. So the first chapter is Courage to Change by Sia. Pretty much what you were talking about. We have to have healthcare leaders that have the courage to change and not do the same, same thing. Um, 
they're, they're, the second chapter is called Keep the Customer Satisfied by Simon and Garfunkel. Do you remember that song? You know, <laughs> I've been slandered. I've been libeled. I heard words I never heard in the Bible, but I got to keep the customer satisfied. And, you know, that talks about sort of the consumerization of healthcare. There's a Nat King Cole song say, I wish I had learned that in school about how we have to start to choose physicians based on self-awareness, empathy, communication skills, and cultural competence, as opposed to memorizing the Krebs cycle. So, so you know, and then and then there's a, the, the index, instead of having a traditional index, is a playlist index. So you can look up any song and then see where that, where that relates to the, uh, to the text. So I think it'll be fun and informative. Um, it's my only book uh, that I've written other than Unhealthcare that isn't a science fiction book. So there's no <laughs> aliens, no, no weird planets. Um, <laughs> But it's um, it's I think it's a really good book for 2023 and 2024 for folks to think about whether you're a patient or a provider or a leader uh, in what we, at least what we need to think about. It certainly doesn't have all the answers, uh, but it has a lot of the questions and a lot of the possible solutions. I probably bring in, you know, examples, 60, 70, 80 examples of different folks doing things differently. And, it, you know, it, it was just looking at what, what's out there that hopefully will we'll make that kind of transformation. And just because I'm curious, I love the spectrum, everything from Sia to Nat King Cole in that book. What's in your playlist today? What are you, your Philadelphia guys at Hollow Notes? What's, what's, what's your inspiration? Where do you go? Well, well, look, I mean, it, I, of course it's fly Eagles fly or fly <laughs> like an Eagle, you know, by Steve Miller, but no, actually, you know, um, what I've been listening to today, interestingly, is um, three songs because um, I've been I've been writing some articles. One is "Skating Away on the Thin Ice of a New Day" by Jethro Tull. Okay. The other is "The Best of You" by by the Foo Fighters. And, I think and Dave because, Letterman loves that song. That's a Letterman. Yeah, song. and and because one of my um, one of my DJ mentors, uh, Jerry Blavitt, the Geeter with the Heater, just uh, passed away. And I was at his funeral this weekend, and he had basically helped discover Dion Warwick, and she gave one of the eulogies. And since I'm going to be uh, on about a two-week uh, tour on trains and planes, uh, I'd say the third one I started to listen to this morning was a Dion Warwick song that probably most of your listeners haven't heard, but it's called Trains and Boats and Planes. No, so, I mean, I think we're all Heartbreaker yeah. and Say Little Prayer fans. I don't, <laughs> I don't know about that. Or, or then came you with the spinners. Yeah, spinners with the spinners, with yeah. yeah. All right, well, we would talk music for hours, but let's get back to the book for a minute because you talk about the need for, for healthcare to offer a more consumer-centered experience. So let's talk about that how healthcare leaders need to evolve in order to get us in that direction. Yeah, look, I mean, one of the one of the scariest things I saw about three months ago, Harris poll did Harris did a poll with Change Change Healthcare, and sixty two percent of people thought that we intentionally make healthcare complicated so people won't good care. Seventy hmm. percent of people said they knew somebody that didn't get healthcare because it was just such a pain. And when you think about, you know, I, I always like to say that. When it comes to treating an individual, we have Star Wars technology when it comes to treating an individual patient in a Fred Flintstone healthcare delivery system. <laughs> right? So I started practicing in 1982. And when I think about how we can handle a high risk obstetric patient and the imaging and everything we have compared to then, like, wow, yeah. wow, it's amazing. But back in 1982, if you need an appointment in many places, you have to listen to 11 options to get an appointment next Tuesday. And in 2023, if you need an appointment in many places, you have to listen to 11 options or go on 11 different internet things to get an appointment next Tuesday. And, you know, well, you say, well, okay, nothing's changed. Well, everything's changed in every other sector of our life, right? I mean, you know, Airbnb replaced, you know, hotels in, in many cases. Warby Parker replaced going to the malls for your contact lenses. We all know what Amazon did and the iPhone. So so um, my commencement speech that, 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 uh, that John Scully had given for me talked about when Steve Jobs got to Apple and everybody was saying you have to have a really, you know, complicated um, business and strategic plan. Steve had a... a a three-year strategic plan with eight words. Year one, we change. Year two, we change the industry. Year three, we change the world. So literally, what, what I think about in this next phase of my career, the third phase of my career from being a private practice obstetrician, being a healthcare leader, and being the dean of, of a few different places is, you know, how do I have to change? What do I have to learn? How can I work with 
folks like the American College of Healthcare Executives to change the industry and work with other leaders? And then how collectively do we change the world and take population health, social determinants, predictive analytics, health equity from these philosophic and academic exercises to the mainstream of clinical care payment models and medical education? If I, if I can do that, you know, then I'll probably go back to being a DJ in my assisted living facility <laughs> 10 years from now. And I'll have such great care on my on my iPhone that, you know, I'll, I'll probably live uh, a very happy uh, and long life. You'll have the best playlist in the facility that I can <laughs> guarantee sure. you. Uh, sure. let, let's wrap up the conversation. You did you did talk about how exciting the future could be. So let's look ahead. Let's look at let's look a decade ahead. Um, 2033. How will the role of a healthcare leader be different than it is today? I think, uh, so first of all, I think what we'll find is that a lot of health system CEOs are not doctors and really have never been in a health system, mm. right? Um, you know, if you think of it, you could be the CEO of GM without being a race car driver or a car engineer. It's a great leader. So I think we'll start to see some health system CEOs because they're fantastic with people, because that's really what it comes down to. The culture of your organization is what's incredibly important. One of my, uh, one of my Wharton, um, uh, professors, you say you should always have five people under you that think they can do a better job than you and three that are right. And I think, you know, that's that's what's going to be important on the people side. I think a lot of what we'll, we're doing will be based on on bots and drones and, and genomics. Um, when I was president of Thomas Jefferson University, if you were a 17 year old African-American woman with a behavioral health problem, very often they would rather talk to a bot that looked like them than, than the, you know, a three-dimensional person that look like me. So starting to look at, at, at the metaverse and, and how we can, we can use that in a positive way, I think will be important. I think we'll be looking at food very differently. You know, if we're sending somebody home with congestive heart failure and we put them on a low salt diet, you know, the number one reason they might come back is how many Domino's pizzas they ordered. And by the way, if they're a single mom of three, they're going to order a lot of Domino's pizzas. So I think we'll start to look at food as medicine and then we'll drone deliver that food. So there will be no food deserts because the whole issue of a food desert is you may be able to walk to a Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's and another person in an underserved neighborhood might be only able to, to, to walk to a bodega. I think we'll, I think we'll have bioprinted organs. Um, one, of the, one of the companies I'm working with literally is uh is talking about having a a pig on a bioprinted lung a totally artificial bioprinted lung from stem cells um so i think will 10 years from now my grand my grandson will say they call me nini but nini uh, is it true that if you needed a kidney back in 2023 you had to get like somebody to actually get a kidney out <laughs> yes uh <laughs> yes, Evan. Believe That's it or how not, we did it back we, then. We were yeah, we were pretty primitive back then. So, and then I think I think we'll have gotten through the next phase of technology and EMRs, and I'll, I'll sort of leave with that. I mean, e EHRs were so important, but when you think about it, EHRs were probably the first progress in history where you needed more people just to get back to where you were, right? How many of us have to hire scribes because mm -hmm. we have EHRs? I have to hire more people because mm -hmm. I have this technology. It'd be like if uh, microwaves came in the 50s and you said, oh, there's one catch. You have to hire somebody to turn it <laughs> on, right? So I think the concept of my talking to you like this will create a chart. So I'll be able to get back to talking directly to a patient and not have to have the computer in the middle. We're already starting to see some of that, uh, you know, with some of the HR companies. So I think the concept of using technology to not just make the wealthy healthier and to actually give us better human interactions. And then finally, uh, I think we will start to choose students in a very, 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 very different way, recognizing that being able to memorize the Krebs cycle is sort of a ridiculous way to choose the next family doctor in, in my neighborhood. It might be an okay way to choose a physician scientist you know, at Yale or Harvard or Jefferson, but that being able to communicate, being able to understand what people need uh, is in some ways much more important than what you can memorize. So I think it'll be a really, really exciting time and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. That's a lot that's going to happen in 10 years. Very exciting, very engaging conversation. You've been listening to Dr. Steve Clasco. He is executive in residence at General Catalyst. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Clasco. 
Eric, thank you. And, you know, I'd like to use this quote. Um, Jason Kidd went to the Dallas Mavericks. They were 24 and 52. Uh, and he said, we're going to turn this team around 360 degrees. We've done a lot of turning things around 360 degrees in healthcare. I think the next 10 years is where we really take off into hyperdrive. I don't know that Jason Kidd really said that. We're going to turn this he thing really around. He really said that. You, yeah. you can look it up. I kid, I kid you not. Sorry for the pun. Good pun. Great pun. Uh, remember that you can hear Dr. Clasco at ACHE's uh, 2023 Congress on Healthcare Leadership, which will take place March 20th through the 23rd. That's in Chicago. To learn more and register, please visit ACHE.org slash Congress. Thank you so much for listening today. And we'll, of course, catch you next time on the Healthcare Executive Podcast from ACHE. This has been the Healthcare Executive Podcast, brought to you by the American College of Healthcare Executives. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider rating and reviewing on iTunes or your podcasting app of choice. And for more information, find us online at ACHE.org. Thank you.